Without any further ado, it is both my honor and my privilege to be the one to welcome Miss Star Scott. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. It's really great to be here tonight, and you're such a nice group. Thank you for being here. Now, I know it's, it's impolite for a gentleman to ask a lady her age, so I won't. Just let me say that I hope I look half as good as you do when I'm your age, whatever that may be. Thank you. So, Thank um, you. <laughs> Uh, the Playboy Club opened its doors in Kansas City in 1964. Uh, when did you begin working there? Uh, the year I came to Playboy was 1965. So one year after they opened, I was knocking at their door. Literally knocking at their door? Yes, I did. <laughs> um, what, what made you want to become a Playboy bunny? Well, I was important to have an income. And I had heard that basically Playboy paid pretty well. So I hopped on the elevator to, to, on the Hotel Continental, went to the top, and told them I was there to put in an application. And obviously they accepted it on the spot? Obviously they accepted it the next day. Okay. <laughs> but they, uh, it was an interesting uh, situation because uh, when I actually went inside the hotel the lights were dim it was very gloomy looking simply because it was a club but uh, I waited for the bunny mother to interview me and waited and waited and I thought I'd never get to see her until this odd looking little fellow came out in a a tux a messy tux with basketball shoes on his laces undone his name was Professor Erwin Corey. Little did I know he was their comedian at the club. And he grabbed me by the arm and he says, if you're here to be a bunny, I'll see that you get hired. And he drug me back to the bunny mother, actually dragged me back. And uh, I thought, this man is crazy. But he introduced me to the bunny mother. He gave her instructions to hire me. And I filled out the app and the next day the call came. Thank gosh for that guy. Now, I'm sure uh, being a woman in the mid-60s, uh, you had to have had some input from uh, close friends and definitely from some family members on your decision to be a bunny in the Playboy Club. What was that experience like? Well, Ryan, it was kind of mixed emotions in my family because my mother and father were both opposed to it uh, simply because of the... Um, the way society looked upon the bunnies was they were scantily clad and they didn't like that first of all so dad wasn't a member oh, is that what you're saying he was not a member <laughs> he was not a member but very honestly they came around and they realized it was a good income for my family so uh, when they did come around they ended up starting to clip pictures from, from the magazine or the newspaper, wherever I'd be doing a promotional, and I'd find out that they would collect them better than I would. So they became a fan of the Playboy after so long of time. So did they eventually join? No. No? No, no, no. no. They <laughs> never go that far. Not quite that far. The club had a lot of rules, and a lot of people didn't like to abide by the rules, but the rules were put in place to keep the girls safe. Well, let's talk about the rules. What, what type of rules did the uh, establishment have in place to protect you as an employee? Uh, probably the most important one was the bunnies couldn't date key holders. And uh, that kept the key holders from asking. So it made it easier for you to keep it on a job level instead of a personal level. What would happen if a bunny broke that rule? Is that like the cardinal rule that you cannot date a key holder? We used to have um, Willemark, which was a detective agency, would come around sporadically throughout the clubs, and they would actually um, test the bunnies on rules and regulations. And it w they were hired by the Playboy clubs to check out the bunnies and make sure they were abiding by all the rules. And they could come in very easily and pose as a club member. And if you made a date with them, you wouldn't have a job. So they'd actually send in undercover narcs to bust they you do. to see. They do. Wow. Did you ever know any, anyone that broke the rules or got busted for yes, dating? Yes, I did. No. Wow. Is that, would it have been a big sacrifice? Was the pay 
uh, pretty well uh, for that period of time while it you did. were running? It paid extremely well. Good and tippers? Good tippers, and uh, basically, a lot of the um, girls who work also on an incentive basis, so if you sold liquor and uh, food, there was a hefty gratuity added onto your check, so that covered quite 18% at that time was quite a bit. I'm sure uh, being, uh, being in that type of, uh, of, of position uh, in, that, in that period of time, you probably uh, became acquainted with several people that might have been of, of fame. Uh, anyone in particular stand out that used to come to the club um, that... Yeah, I kind of ran through these names in my mind before I came because, and I was in awe of some of them. Um, maybe some of them you know, maybe you don't. Uh, Glory Loring was actually a um, singer. Uh, Grace Marquet was a singer. You all know Andy Williams, I know you know that. And I have all of his albums. Oh, do you? You no, still? No, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that, that says so much. Really. I know it does. <laughs> <laughs> well, what music did you listen to back then? Um, goodness, usually rock. Rock? Mm -hmm. No, no easy listening. No Jim Neighbors. No. 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 no okay. No, no, no. Well, it, it, it's from the era. That, were you a big Doors fan? Big Beatles fan? Uh, Beatles, Beach Boys. Um, mamas and Papas. Wow. Does anyone remember them? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, let's see, Credence Clearwater. That was another 60s wow. band. Jefferson Airplane. Um, Gary oh, Puckett. Goodness. Were you into Gary Puckett? Not so much. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not so much. I had dinner with Gary Puckett Are you once. Serious? If you, he was an asshole. <laughs> I'm not a nice smug, to know. That, that's, a, that's a story for another time. You were a bunny during a time of uh, tremendous political and social upheaval. Uh, the Tet Offensive happened in 1968. It was the turning point of the Vietnam War. Uh, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were both assassinated mm -hmm. that year. Um, this is a period of, of our recent history that really did define what was going to happen in the future. Things that still affect us today. And I know from our phone conversation we had, you weren't necessarily politically active um, during that period of time, but you did mention that you were personally corresponding with soldiers that were on the front lines of the Vietnam War. Yes. Um, so why don't we start there. Uh, how did you come about receiving correspondence from soldiers? Well, primarily it was from the magazine. Um, soldiers would see your picture in the magazine and they would write and request you to write back or, or to send them a picture. And uh, some of them I would go ahead and write. Uh, the heart, the um, letters were heartwarming and uh, so I would sit down when I had some time and write back. How many letters do you think you received that period of time? From, from soldiers in Vietnam anyway? Um, Probably a couple hundred. Wow. Yeah. And you've brought some of those with you tonight. I, I brought several and thought maybe I'd give you an excerpt from them because I found them interesting simply because they represented an era. And um, I was in a warm, fuzzy place at the club earning a good living, but here were these guys over on the battlefront. and it brought a whole new perspective to my world when they wrote me. So that was the least I could do is write back. A very noble perspective. And would you, would you care to read uh, some excerpts from them? Would anybody like to hear? Okay. I have three letters and I'll read just excerpts from them, but they were the most typical ones, I think. Hi, Star, I hope that this finds you feeling good. For some well, unknown reason, I really feel good today. The card you sent got here on the 25th, but I didn't get it until the 27th, as I was out in the field at the time of arrival. I was very glad to hear from you. It helped liven up the day. Things have really been quite... Um, 
quiet around here the past couple of weeks. You'd almost think Charlie had given up. I guess his wait, he's waiting for the rainy season to start again. The brigade school here put up a sign that I thought was really cute. It reads, the training you receive here gives the enemy soldier the maximum opportunity to give his life for his country. The school is where you go for training in jungle warfare, guerrilla tactics, etc. When you first come into South Vietnam, I guess they offer some of the best training in the military. I hope uh, your day turns out real well. I adore the facial expressions in, your, in the magazine. Remember that when you write to us, you are cheering up the life of a homesick GI each time you do, namely me. Uh, here's another one. This one, uh, this one was sad, and I only brought two. I, I said three earlier. I apologize. No, that's okay. Um, <laughs> And this was, broke my heart because I had written him before. He says, Dear Star, thank you for your answer. I'm writing you from San Diego Naval Hospital. As I, knew they, uh, as I knew they would, the VC bullets caught up with me on May 13, three in the leg and one in the forearm. Uh, bad as it may sound, I'm a very lucky man. No bones were broken, and I will, I will be well within a month. It probably is a crazy thing to say, but I'm glad I got shot. May 13th, 25 of us were wounded and eight killed. One of my best friends died in my arms. It made it, it made me, um, it made it get to my mind and start wishing that I was on the battlefront again, again, and again. You don't read or hear these things in the States. But you asked to hear the truth, so I'm telling you. Although it was very trying at times, no amount of money could buy my experiences. I'm a better man for it, and I'm confident that I can face any problem life might have to offer. And then it goes into saying that Uncle Sam will be paying for his education once he comes back home. And it seems to be that was a lot of the military would say that they were looking forward to getting an education when they came back here. So these were, these were guys that were out fighting for what we have here. And it makes one feel very inadequate when you read some of those. One last thing uh, before we go. Uh, during, your, uh, during your time at the Playboy Club, uh, there were race riots happening in every major city and some of the smaller cities across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any experiences working in Kansas City at the time when you were a bunny during any of the race riots? Actually, that was after. Was that, okay, the was that after? The Kansas City riots were after, and uh, I was still working in the downtown area, and they were, uh, it was late hours because it was the club life, and uh, we heard a lot of the rioting from a distance. Uh, gunshots, um, you'd hear a lot of horns honking. It, it was really very disturbing to get out of work at night late and, and to hear that in the background. Well, and you were a young mother on her way home to right. two children at the time. And not knowing what those children were doing, you know, was it as bad back home as it was where you were working? You didn't know. So that was before cell phones and everything else. So there was not much communication there. It's just you drive home, you find out how everyone's doing. So yeah, there was a lot of unrest in the downtown area.